is the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. Welcome back to the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. I'm Ashton Cohen. I am joined today by Dr. Mary Grabar. Mary is the author of two excellent books, Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America, and her latest title, Debunking the 1619 Project, Exposing the Plan to Divide America. We're going to get both of them today, especially the uh, 1619 Project. Uh, Mary is also a resident fellow at the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. So Mary, thank you so much for being on with me today. It's a real pleasure. Yes. Well, thanks for having me. Let's start with your 1619 books. I think it was, I think it was excellent and really telling of where we are today. So a lot of people have heard of the 1619 Project, I'm sure. What is it exactly, if you can explain it to people who haven't actually done the deep dive in it or, or really read what it's about, and why should people care about it, and what, what's it trying to accomplish? Yeah, well, that yeah, it's good to start there. Um, the, the 1619 Project was actually just a special issue of the New York Times Magazine that came out on August 18th, 2019, to um, commemorate, ostensibly, the arrival of the first Africans in Jamestown in 1619, the 400th anniversary. Um, there were other commemorations that I noted in my book, debunking the 1619 project, such as in Time Magazine and USA Today. Um, but they got nowhere near the traction of the 1619 project in the New York Times. Um, that you know, was due to the fact that they had a multi-million dollar advertising campaign and um, that they immediately inserted it into schools, 3,500 schools across the country with no vetting. These were pre-made lessons that basically asked students from K through 12 to regurgitate the you know, ludicrous claims that are being made, the ludicrous historical claims that are being made in the 1619 Project. And um, generally, I think, you know, most people, I, I include myself, would not really have cared, you know, had the New York Times published this magazine. And we know what the New York Times is like. We know their bias. And so we take them with a grain of salt. And if they wanted to publish the special issue, 100 pages of the 1619 Project with this erroneous history, we wouldn't care. Let everyone else, let the free market, you know, work the way it does. Let people line up and buy it. They can uh, read it, reread it, frame it have discussion groups, line the hamster cage with it, do whatever they want with it. But I think, you know, quite understandably, uh, the objection came because of the fact that it was put right into the schools immediately. So, you know, perfect timing, uh, you know, towards the end of August, school year starts, and there it is, kids K through 12 are regurgitating the uh, points of the 1619 Project. And in terms of its content, um, the goal is to uh, ultimately eliminate 1776 as the year of our founding and to replace it with the year 1619 uh, when our nation began, not as a democracy, but as a slaveocracy. And that's the word that is used in the 1619 project. So fundamentally transform our understanding of this nation's history um, and to basically eliminate the 4th of July holiday. What would be the goal of trying to redefine when our nation was founded? Well, that has always been the Marxist goal is to, um, you know, pick at uh, the tensions, um, you know, that was started by Lenin in 1919 and 1920 when the Communist Party USA established their headquarters in New York City. Since that time, since Lenin's orders, and I have those quoted uh, in my book, uh, the goal has been to use, as the term was then, the Negro 
to um, foment division. So the aim was to exacerbate the tensions that there understandably were in this country. And of course, 1919, 1920, it was a bad time to be a black person in America. There were lynchings. Uh, Jim Crow reigned throughout the South de facto. Segregation was in effect in the North and in other parts of the country. But um, the communists saw this as a weak point. And so for over a hundred years, they have been trying, you know, they've been sort of picking at the scab and trying to, you know, keep those old um, conflicts and resentments alive, you know, long after the civil rights movement, after 60 years, we just pretend that the civil rights movement didn't happen or even that abolition happened. Mm -hmm. So the, the parallel you draw to communism is, is interesting. The establishing that as sort of one of the foundations of this retrospective of the American ideal and history. So as I was mentioning to you right before we started about how this book I'm reading, uh, Sean McMeekin, Stalin's War, and it, it's just, it's mind boggling how many communists were actually installed in every element of American society, like every single aviation firm had communists in it, you know, defense firms, like the people who built planes, tanks. It's really mind boggling how they're able to get people in everywhere. And that was essentially the plan was to get into America from within and then destabilize things. With Lenin's plan, so he, as you say, he targeted the African American community because he, you know, sense that there, there was obviously tension, there was disenfranchisement, and that sort of, and try to make, make them sort of, you know, communism as a, as a springboard for, for that community, focusing on their efforts there. And then we fast forward, and we see a lot of the, especially I think in the 1960s and 70s, and you correct me, we see a lot of the switch over from having sort of Marxist-leaning professors, which used to be the thing, and into this, into this new thing, which is sort of this postmodernism, right? That was that that kind of became that swept the academic landscape, not only in the United States but in, in Western Europe. And it was essentially using that Marxist dialectic, bourgeoisie versus proletariat. Communism didn't become so tenable anymore after like 50 to 100 million people died. So then, if they sort of start switching it into things like you know white versus black, oppressor versus oppressed, focusing it on cultural and ethnic issues, not just, you know, bourgeoisie versus proletariat. And in your previous book had, has a section of, your previous book focuses on Howard Zinn. What was Howard Zinn's role in reshaping the American narrative of our history? And how does that relate to what the New York Times is trying to accomplish now with the 1619 Project. Yeah, well, um, yeah, what you were describing was, I think, the Frankfurt School, uh, you know, th with the notions of an Antonio Gramsci, and, uh, you know, they had tried to get, you know, the, the slogan was black and white, unite and fight, you know, so the proletariat would get together and, um, you know, fight the capitalists, but that didn't happen because, you um, you know, we always had the, uh, the dream of the middle class and African Americans, no less than white Americans or any other group, you know, want to achieve the, um, the American dream. And, uh, you know, they weren't fooled by the communists. They were smart. They could see what they were um, about, which was to destroy this country and to bring about a communist revolution. Um, and Howard Zinn's role in that was as a member of the Communist Party from about 1948 to 1953. Uh, he was spreading the word. He was teaching Marxist theory at the Communist Party headquarters in Brooklyn, where he was living at the time. And, you know, of course, he denied that he had ever been a member of the party. But I rely on um, the historian Ron Radish himself, a a short-term uh, former member of the Communist Party to analyze his uh, Howard Zinn's FBI file, which runs to almost 500 pages. And Howard Zinn was a communist. He was certainly a communist sympathizer and um, probably on the orders of the party leaders, 
he uh, dropped his official membership and was told to go and infiltrate the institutions. So as an academic historian, uh, he went and taught at Spelman College, a small Christian school for black women in Atlanta. And there he radicalized the women and spread the poisonous ideology, was um, fired from that position by the first black and the first um, male president of the college for, quote, insubordination. And um, then, of course, like many leftists, landed right on his feet at Boston University, where he led a pretty, you know, nice, you know, life in terms of, you know, workload and, um, you know, pay until he retired in 1988. And of course, he had a lot of time to radicalize students and other people especially as the Vietnam War was gearing up. So he was very, very much involved in that. But his goal was to inspire a communist revolution. Uh, and he did that through his very distorted history, uh, you know, of the American people. And he, so he, he spread his toxic ideology through students He's influenced generations of people, of teachers, who take this jaundiced view of American history. It's warped. And the reason it's warped is because what he does, as I demonstrate, you know, page after page in my book, is that he twists around words of other people. He leaves out critical words. He plagiarizes from people who are not historians. And so the book is, his book is full of lies. And the lies are written to put America in a very negative light, the same kind of light that, you know, the communists mm -hmm. Uh, want everyone to see America. So bo both works, the 1619 Project and the People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, uh, work towards coloring readers' views of, the, uh, of this country, and they do it through inaccuracies, outright lies, distortions, uh, lies by omission, and they use the same strategies. Howard Zinn used more of a class warfare, that's the more traditional uh, Marxist approach, but the 1619 Project goes for a more overt racial warfare of blacks versus right. whites. And just so people have a little bit of context on it, the uh, Howard Zinn's book, People's History of, of the United States, is one of the most influential books in, in like academia, right? High school students get it to this day all across the country. You know, it's just popularized mm -hmm. all over. It's probably what, like top couple most famous history books in, in America, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's broken all publishing records. Uh, it, it has sold well over 3 million copies. It sells more each year than the previous wow. year. Uh, it's still in the top categories on Amazon. It's one of its, you know, bestsellers. Uh, it's still making money for the estate, you know, 10, 12 years after Howard Zinn's death and uh, for the publisher, HarperCollins. His central tenets were basically, what would you say were his most damaging lies? What, were, did it have to do with America's founding like the 1619 Project focuses on? Or was it sort of coloring certain American events as being oppressive towards uh, different ethnic groups? What were his most damaging narratives yeah well it starts with christopher columbus um and you know the the lies about christopher columbus that he um raped and pillaged and cut off the natives hands all in the quest for gold you know he was driven uh, by capitalist greed and that's what motivated him and this nation is built on capitalist greed the founders uh, you know, what, when they pledged their lives and their sacred honor, which they did, they could have been easily killed for treason. Uh, they, you know, those were not the real motives, according to Howard's. And the real motives were to uh, establish power so they could maintain their riches. So it was all for class. There were no principles involved. And it's a very cynical view of our founding, of, of the discovery and the founding, and everything from those points 
uh, continues and that continuum, you know, every injustice, you know, of course, our, all the injustices are overblown um, and, you know, documents are altered, but everything, uh, you know, has begun at those starting points. So the nation is illegitimate, he claims. We never should have been here. Columbus had no right to be here. He didn't discover anything. You know, there were Indians living here, and they were living in peace right, right. and harmony. <laughs> and then we came, and we ruined this Eden. Like Pocahontas is a happy, cheery Disney film. There was no war or mayhem or well, tribe yeah. fighting, right? It was, yeah, it was like a hippie right. commune, you know, if you can imagine. <laughs> Everyone, you know, it was free yeah. love, sharing, uh, peace were all about and that. harmony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so so what he does is he says, you know, well, we had no right to be here in the first place. And that our government, which is allegedly uh, a representative democracy, a constitutional republic, that's all a farce, according to Howard Zinn. It's, you know, voting doesn't matter, he says. Uh, you know, participation in this system doesn't matter. Uh, our justice system is unfair. Everything about this system is unfair. And so the naive reader, the high school student who could be assigned this, or the college student, uh, you know, wonders, well, what, what, what is there to replace mm -hmm. it? And Howard Zinn paints this picture of this utopia, this socialist utopia. And so the heroes are all the radical leftists who are working for a revolution. So uh, it's clearly a distorted history aimed at inspiring a revolution towards communism. Does he give any examples of countries that he thinks does do it right in, in his text? Or is it just... Your radical stuff. Uh, well, there, there are so many instances that he points to in Central America and then after the Second World War in Greece and in Turkey, where people were, you know, were starting to have this new kind of society and new kind of government. But then the U.S. sent in mm. troops and uh, the plantation owners and the capitalists and they uh, destroyed this budding uh, utopian society. So each time, you know, we had this glimmer, there was this glimmer of hope of this Marxist utopia. The U.S. sent in troops and advisors and businessmen, and, and we destroyed all hopes for there ever being a just society in those That's countries. Yeah, Central America, that's a bastion of human rights. It's, just, it's <laughs> interesting, too, the... Um, so you see this was in, and we'll get into the 1619 Project now with Nicole Hannah-Jones, that the motivations of the people who have done the most to expand human rights in, in the history of the world are always perceived as being like greedy or self-interested. But then a lot of these people were apologists for Fidel Castro's of the world and the Hugo Chavez's, and those guys literally lived like billionaires, had their own private islands and even I think Castro's daughter today lives like a billionaire in uh, I don't know, Europe. They, their, their kids always mm -hmm. move to Europe for some reason. They never stay behind. And, <laughs> uh, and of course, they're, they're doing it for the people. Meanwhile, the people are the ones who suffer, and they're the only ones who, who profit from it. It's just a you know, typical thing that you see with them. With the 1619 Project, so obviously, so they're against the founding of, of America, trying to reframe it as being that we that the founding fathers broke away not to expand civil rights or motivated by their Enlightenment ideals, which they talked about incessantly, but rather to preserve their slave-owning interests, right? That's kind of the, the crux. They have a particular distaste. Well, I guess they, they, they don't like any of the founding fathers, right? Even John Adams, they, they're not, they don't really talk about because he, he was not even involved in slavery at all. Right. Well, what, what, what the 1619 Project attempts to do, and there's a hardcover book that has come out that's almost 600 pages long, it attempts to center the revolution in Virginia uh, rather than in the New England mm -hmm. states and Massachusetts, which, you know, the, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones says, you know, that American students have been taught wrong, that really the center of the action was not in the Northeast, but it was in Virginia, because, um, you know, the 
you know, the, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, was a, a Virginian and a slave owner. Uh, so was George Washington um, and, and several others. And she makes this claim, which was immediately pounced on by, you know, Sean Wilentz and Gordon Wood and three other historians. Uh, she makes this claim that uh, the reason the Revolutionary War was fought, the war for independence was fought, a main reason was to preserve slavery, that England was on uh, the way to abolishing slavery, and that the uh, plantation owners were afraid that they would no longer be able to own slaves. And of course, that is a ludicrous statement historically, um, but but that's sort of the basis for the argument that that um, that the the war was not fought because of the oppression of you know King George or uh, because you know the founders wanted independence or they wanted a new f type of government, uh, but it was because they wanted to preserve slavery. So slavery was the motivation. Or you know, just about everything that made this country what it is. That that central premise that they decide they launched this revolution to preserve slavery. What's wrong with that? How is that historically inaccurate? Well, the problem is in the chronology. <laughs> um, you know, the the fighting had already begun in Bunker Hill and uh, you know Lexington and Concord. Um, you know before. Uh, the proclamation of Lord Dunmore in on November, I think it was seventh or sixth or seventh of 1775, where he lured um, you know the enslaved to come over to his side, promising freedom. Lord Dunmore, the governor of Virginia, of course, was a slave owner himself. Um, but you know the fighting had already begun. Um, George Washington was up in Massachusetts. He was commander in chief of the Continental Army. And um, so it's, you know, it, it happened after things had already happened. And the evidence that the fear of uh, slavery being outlawed is just not there. I mean, a few, some plantation owners here and there, you know, of course, you know, could have been nervous about that or worried about that, but that wasn't the reason. It, it wasn't even a main reason. It wasn't even an important reason. But in order to promote the thesis, you know, this and that's this is what it is. It's not a history. History works from empirical evidence. You don't start with a thesis and then find right. the evidence for it. You work right from the evidence what happened and then and then you draw your conclusions. But the thesis that's motivating the 1619 Project is that um, black people, first as the enslaved and then as you know the oppressed, are the ones who built the wealth of this country and also led it to democracy, which was not achieved until 1965. And we still have a long ways to go, according to the 1619 Project. You know, we need to do such things like have universal health care, uh, you know, guaranteed incomes, reparations, right. <laughs> uh, universal abortion yes. rights, and then we'll yeah, you know, have that. Right. Then, which is what all African-Americans want, according to the uh, 1619 project. You mentioned something interesting in your book about how – talking about this, this notion that America was built on slavery and every, everything was you – know, is, is a result on that, including you know, like, what, like nuclear power and the internet and you know, the, the Wright brothers building a plane. Everything has its origin in slavery apparently. But slavery, you mentioned in your book, never accounted for more than what, 5 percent of the GDP in the antebellum era. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and Matthew Desmond, who is a contributor of one of the essays in the magazine version and also in the hardcover version, rely on this long debunked new history of capitalism, I believe it's called, which was a new, it's a neo-Marxist school. And uh, one of the practitioners is Cornell University professor Edward Baptist. 
uh, who wrote this book in 2014, I think it was, called The Half That Has Never Been Told, which has been widely panned by economic historians. And the problem is that he just can't do math. <laughs> so, you know, you've got this theory of how the, uh, the wealth w was acquired in the antebellum period, but he's off by about, a, you know, uh, he's off by, you know, 45 percent because it wasn't 50 percent. It was only about 5 percent right. of GDP. So it's like a thousand percent. And so what it does. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, right. Yeah. Go ahead. You're right, right. So, so yeah, off by a zero. And, <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, it, it's, it doesn't hold mathematically. Um, it's, there are gross errors in calculation. Uh, the reasons for, um, you know, the increase in productivity of cotton is attributed to you know, the maltreatment of slaves. And, you know, and I'm not saying that slaves, you know, led good right, lives or easy lives, but, but, it, it fails to account for improvements in, you know, in the seeds and in, uh, you know, the farming methods that, you know, that's what increased production as well. So there are all these gaping errors and, um, and the 1619 project takes off mm -hmm. from that. So Matthew Desmond, who is not an economic historian, he's a sociologist. He, he writes this essay. And Nicole Hannah Jones, the creator of it, uh, repeats his claims in her essay. And so, what we've got then is, you know, one leg of this project, which claims that uh, the economic wealth of this country today is due to the slaves. And as a result, we should have reparations because the slaves built the wealth of this country. Right. Okay. So, so that's an important point. So yeah, it's 5% of GDP even in the antebellum era. The South, which the slave, where slavery was based, was far more impoverished than the North, which is why they lost the Civil War. And so it actually wasn't a, a terribly economically efficient thing, especially when in the era when industrialization was taking off, the, the South was being held back by this evil practice of slavery. So the correlation between slavery being the backbone of American wealth is just is asinine, right? Yeah, and as um, other, the economic historians that I cite, I cite three of them, uh, as some of them say, this revives the old King Cotton argument which was made by the Southerners that the, this country is relying mm -hmm. on the production of cotton. They grossly overestimated, you know, the contribution of cotton plantations to the economy. So ironically, the 1619 project is reviving that myth. And as you said, um, yeah, there were some people that became incredibly wealthy but these were the big plantation owners. They were the one percent, if you will, of the old South. It, right. The uh, working class didn't benefit from slavery uh, at all. And speaking about the dispersion of slavery throughout the country, so it was only allowed in the South, basically leading up to the Civil War, right? So by the time we get into the 19th century, northern states outlawed it, the southern states still had it. In the South, you mentioned 25 percent of families had a slave and the overwhelming majority of those i believe were they just they had one and then so that's what basically 12 13 percent of the u.s population had slaves and then a very small portion of that were as you said those plantation owners who were you know who had like what 20 or so or more or multiple they were they were a scintilla of a scintilla and then you, you had basically what like 12 13 percent of the country actually engage in this practice of slavery? Yeah. Um, well, what I did is I looked at the number of black slave owners. So uh, a couple of Canadian researchers have updated the research of Carter Woodson, uh, who was a prominent African-American historian in the early part of the 20th century. And they looked at the records and they found that about 6% of whites owned hmm. slaves and 2% of free blacks did. So when you get to the percentage of 
you know, people who did own slaves, it's a, it's a very small percent. Uh, we have the impression that, you know, most, you know, people in the South right. own white people, own black slaves. And, and that's just not true. And it was a, it was a concentration of wealth. And, um, you know, some of the black slave owners were, sometimes they were the most they were the wealthiest people in their particular area of the state. So uh, it was something that was practiced definitely by a minority. So in that way, you know, you can't say that enslavement produced most of the wealth of this country. Right. And, you know, I was taught in the California school system, the LAUSD. And so that component of it was the slavery component and, and sort of insinuating that this was like a widespread thing all over the country and that you got the impression that every Southerner had slaves. Now, frame, going back to sort of the the initial framing of the 1619 Project, and I think one of the things you do well, which is you basically take a macro approach of slavery and then sort of narrow it down. So obviously the entire world, every, ass, every corner of the world where there's civilization since the beginning of civilization, virtually every culture in the world has participated in, including the Native Americans, including the Africans themselves, mm-hmm. vast majority of the slaves that were captured, or sorry, that's where the slaves that were brought to the United States were captured by other Africans and then handed over to Europeans, right? Like Europeans hardly actually even went into, or Americans hardly actually went to the interior of Africa because it was too dangerous. It's an interesting um, observation you make there. And the United States basically helped lead the charge to the abolition of slavery. And so there's a couple of things I never even knew about, which you mentioned about how from from going back to like the 1600s, Rhode Island passed a law that all slaves brought there would be set free within 10 years. And Pennsylvania tried to do the same thing in 1708. So we're going back a long time. And there there were issues with it back then, which is amazing. Slavery is still going on to this day and lasted into the 20th century in so much part of the world, obviously predates America. There's nothing uniquely American about slavery. Uh, the unique aspect is that America fought mm-hmm. a war to end it. But we're looking at even before America was a country, there were people in this country who were really trying to end this, this establishment. And then there's this quote in there, you talk about how the British rule seemed to harden slavery. And then 1772, Virginia passed at least... 33 times prior to 1772, they tried 33 times to prohibit the importation of slaves, and England annulled them. So can you kind of go over the efforts made basically around the time of of the Constitution? Because you also mentioned how Jefferson had a line or tried to incorporate something in there about ending slavery. Can you sort of go into that for people not familiar? Yeah, well, um, there was this long passage when Jefferson was writing the Declaration of Independence that went into... Uh, you know, how uh, they wanted to uh, stop the importation of slaves and that the King George had imposed it on them. Now, remember at this time, uh, you know, uh, England is the top slave trader. They have a vested interest in selling slaves to the colonies. Um, That was excised because of... um, because I think it was mostly South Carolina. They didn't want to make too much of an issue of it. But Thomas Jefferson himself, though he did own slaves, hated the institution. And, uh, you know, he was born into a slave-owning family. And, you know, by the time he came of age, he was responsible for several dozen lives. I mean, you had families and, you know, he inherited these slaves. He had to run his mother's farm, and um, but he hated the institution. He felt it was uh, unjust, it was degrading, and, uh, you know, could never come up with a way that would be accepted during his lifetime that would eliminate it. But uh, one of the first steps, he felt, was to end uh, the international slave trade. He called it a you know, abomination. And uh, that was, you know, the first thing he did when he became president was to usher that through, uh, you know, that clause that had been put in there during the Constitutional Convention that by 1808, uh, there would be no more importation of slaves. So he felt that was the first step. And, 
you know, so there, there was this conflict between the royal governors and the colonists. The colonists, sometimes for selfish reasons, we have to admit, you know, they, they felt they, they didn't want too many slaves. They were afraid of slave uprisings. But a lot of them also just did not like the institution or felt that, you know, the, the ways they were brought over, the horrendous conditions, uh, were just, you know, cruel. They, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with that and so tried to end the international slave trade. So I kind of go into the various, you know, how the various colonies in their different ways had, uh, you know, tried to either slow down or eliminate the importation of slaves and then met resistance from the royal governors and, uh, and, and couldn't do that. And so, you know, they wanted self-rule. And, you know, there, there was, I don't think there was, yeah, I mean, there were some people who really thought that slavery was the way to go, but then there were so many that hated it, so many who um, hated it, but didn't know how to extricate themselves from it. So it's very complicated. And um, to, to claim, as the 1619 Project does, that all slave owners just really reveled in sadistically treating their slaves and, you know, working them to death. It's just, abs it's false. It's just not real history. Mm -hmm. And just to frame it again, so the entire world was basically practicing slavery for, again, being a civilization. Mm -hmm. When Jefferson was around, it was still the norm virtually all, all over the world. And here's Jefferson mm -hmm. clearly having demonstrating in writings that he's opposed to it, he's clearly conflicted by it, he, he despises it, but what do you think his mentality was at the time? Was it just a, you know, I know this is disgusting, but we can't flip the switch right now because that in, could tear everything apart, uh, and we need to have sort of like a, like a gradual approach, and eventually this is going to uh, basically winnow itself out what was what was his sort of thinking on it well he he felt um he changed his opinions um as many people do throughout his lifetime he he felt that it should be outlawed in the new territories but then he adopted this new theory he from discussions he'd had with someone else about diffusionism he felt that if it was allowed and if it spread if it wasn't contra concentrated that it would eventually just die out of its you know own accord and um but but he he could see that that you know that there were vested interests there were many people who you know were accumulating wealth off of slavery and uh it was difficult to convince them um, to to abolish it, and he was, you know, at one point, you know, this is when he was seventy one years old. I tell this story about uh, his correspondence with Edward Coles, who was the younger brother of Isaac Coles, who had been Jefferson's secretary, and uh, and Cole Edward Coles was secretary to Madison, and he's twenty seven years old. And he's writing to Jefferson, who's in retirement at Monticello, and he says, you know, you could, you know, say something against slavery. You know, you have the influence. If you go out there and uh, you speak out, we can eliminate slavery. And, you know, Jefferson had tried. He uh, had written this bill that had been introduced that would just gradually eliminate slavery and just got a lot of pushback. And he also understood that if you push something through too quickly or before the right time, you can actually make things worse. You can build up resistance to it. And he certainly didn't want to do that. He didn't want to sabotage any efforts to gradually eliminate slavery. So anyway, he's having this conversation by letter with Edward Coles. And Edward Coles is this idealistic young man. And he's like, you know, a fellow Virginian. And, we're, you know, we're going to eliminate slavery. Well, he moves out to um, Illinois. Uh, and he has and he's inherited these slaves. And he's a very wealthy 
young man. And uh, what he does is he has to provide for two old women who can no longer work. He can't take them out of Virginia. The slaves he takes out, he buys them 160 acres for each family. And he goes out to Illinois and um, and then he sees there that people, um, you know, are resistant to free blacks and that they uh, encounter all kinds of uh, hostility and um, abrogation of their rights. And he finally moves back east and marries this rich woman and moves to Philadelphia. And he, he, you know, he has come up against reality, the idealistic young man who, yeah, yeah, rah, rah, we're going to end slavery. He, he sees what has happened and he moves back east where he doesn't have to deal with it. And the tragic end of that story is, is that his son fights in the Civil War, but he fights for the Confederacy. So, you know, this is what history is. History isn't this simple story that Nicole right. Hannah Jones and the other right. contributors to the 1619 Project want to present that, you know, um, you know, it was greed that was driving uh, slavery and, uh, you, you know, and it would have been very simple to just end it. And, and that's right. what I try to do in my book is to show the complexity of, uh, you know, of the situation and what people uh, faced. You know, we, we aren't like little gods. We can't just, you know, have our wills. Um, you know, come up, you know, direct things the way we want them. Yeah. And it just shows you, I think she has this quote in there about in the 1619 project, Nicole Hannah Jones, about how the American slavery was unlike anything that existed in the world before, which, you know, just shows her right. lack of, of historical literacy. It's like, this was everywhere. And, and then she even mentions like, like a parallel to the Nazis, like the Nazis were inspired by that. It's like, are you, I mean, they, they were inspired by that and not like every other instance in, in human history. It's just, uh, you know, it really goes to show you, I think, they, between their sort of myopic view on, on slavery and the Nazis, there's, there doesn't seem to be much actual literacy of anything else that happened in between or before. And I, I like that you brought up the, the Apple situation, like Apple and Nike, who incessantly talk about all this uh, social justice stuff and, you know, will uh, chime in about how the legacy of slavery is still, you know, affecting and causing injustices today. Meanwhile, they were lobbying the Congress to get rid of a anti-slave labor mm -hmm. bill and they benefit themselves from slavery, essentially slavery, that's going on in Asia today. So it's just, it really goes to show you just the, the, the framing of their narrative has actually become the dominant narrative, unfortunately. And, and so we have to basically unwind that. I think it's really important that your book's doing that. So they, they obviously they hate Jefferson, you know they make, they make him to be this this unusually bad figure in, in history. They also don't seem to like Lincoln very much, which is which is pretty interesting. I'm sure you saw the San Francisco school board. Three of the members got recalled. Those were the same individuals who were trying to rename schools after Abraham Lincoln. And so speaking about communism, which is kind of interesting, because like even Fidel Castro loved Abraham Lincoln, right? Like there there are people in Cuba who are able to have pictures of Lincoln posted uh, in their homes because Lincoln was considered a hero even Cuba, but apparently not for them. What's this uh, hatred towards Lincoln? Well, it's, it's part of the overall objective to not allow there to be any heroes in American history. Uh, you have to knock them all down, just like Howard Zinn did. Um, so Thomas Jefferson, who, you know, has been considered to be the apostle of liberty, mm -hmm. no longer is an Abraham Lincoln is no longer the great emancipator, um, you know, even though he, you know, literally was assassinated for his beliefs, you know, he wasn't quite woke. Right. <laughs> he, you know, for political reasons, um, you know, uh, advocated the social segregation. So he wasn't quite up to their standards. And if you don't meet their standards 100 percent, well, that means you are just you know, one of the bad guys, and you need to be denounced, and you are a hypocrite. And so it's part of the overall strategy to undermine faith in the American system, to see this country as essentially good, not perfect. You know, there is no 
place on earth that's perfect, but um, as even good or as a leader, you know, in world history, in democracy and freedom. So you have to, you know, knock down all these all these heroes in order to just present a, a nation that's not even worth defending or respecting or loving. Um, and it, it's the reason we, you know, we saw that with the knocking down of the statues in 2020. Now the name renaming of the schools. It's it's the same objective as Howard right. Zinn had uh, to throw doubt on. Uh, even uh, the existence of this country, wh- whether it should exist, uh, you know, and of course the implication is is that we need a different form of government, a socialist form of government. Right. It's it's the old Maoist playbook, except you know, at least in the in China mm-hmm. today, they're they are actually very nationalistic and very proud of their country. But of course, Mao Mao mm-hmm. pretty much got rid of everything that existed before him. Right. It was like year zero, and and everything after Mao is yeah. is you know. The history that you should learn, but you know, I, I make this joke all the time about how I have more respect for at least the Chinese communists than these people because at least, at least they're efficient, and you know, they, they, like I guarantee you, the Chinese aren't calling math a white supremacist subject and trying to dumb down their own students. They're the exact opposite. They're trying to get everybody into right, engineering right. and science to overtake the, the evil West. So, you know, I think these people are even more resentful exactly. than that. With respect to it being taught in schools so you mentioned there's several thousand schools even today that have the 1619 lesson plans that were pretty much instantly adopted into the school system i assume that's still the case is there anything that you know that's being done Mm -hmm. about counteracting that oh yeah i think over half of the states have either introduced or passed legislation forbidding the use of the 1619 project or and or critical race theory so there's been pushback on that. And of course, Nicole Hannah-Jones and her defenders, she's got some historians who are defending her, are calling this censorship, um, which is, right. you know, bogus. Because, because, you know, these were lessons that had been pre-made. So the New York Times, a for-profit company, collaborated with a nonprofit called the Pulitzer Center, which is funded um, by Mark Zuckerberg and Pierre Omidyar uh, to put together these lessons and then slip them into schools. No vetting, no committees of educators, no parents, no school boards. They were just like, voila, at the beginning of the school year. And um, and now with the hardcover books, there's a children's book called Born on the Water, and then there's the big fat hardcover collection that's an expansion of the original magazine. Um, so the children's book is intended for grades K through eight, and um, and the other book is intended for high school students. And there are lessons, free downloadable lessons at the publisher's website, and those lessons were produced by a group called Learning for Justice, which is the educational arm of the Southern Poverty Law Center. That. So, <laughs> so you can see why people would be opposed to having these lessons in schools, right? And I might add that there are some uh, that there are other laws that are um, transparency laws that allow uh, parents to see everything that their children are going to be subjected to in the classroom. Uh, all the textbooks, the curricular materials, and uh, anything that they may come across. Yeah, it's just funny. The uh, left-wing and communist authoritarians who push for censorship in virtually every single aspect of life, now they're, <laughs> they're, they're apparently they're against censorship when it comes to schools. And you know, Supreme Court jurisprudence has made clear that there is actually no free speech in the classroom because you're dealing with children, right? You can't show kids hardcore pornography in a classroom. Yeah. Like it's, you know, there's a lot of things you can't do in a classroom. It's one exactly. area where there isn't free speech really in, in public life, but that's the one area they want it because, and they don't want parents being able to look in and see what they're, they're teaching their kids. It's the hypocrisy is yeah. um, outstanding. <laughs> Absolutely. What's um, aside from your two great books, what's a book that you would recommend people who want to get more educated about, you know, the, the actual history of the United States, warts and all, that's fairly objective, that tackles elements of maybe American history that you don't hear in, in your uh, classic K through 12 
education anything you'd recommend well there's a very good book uh, for high school students especially is called the land of hope land of hope by mm -hmm. Wilfred yeah, McClay and it's very even-handed and I think uh, you know high school students would really enjoy it it doesn't you know, present, as the critics say, a whitewashed right. history that doesn't mention slavery, but it presents it in context. Um, so I think that that's very good for, you know, people who want to get a sub, you know, another history book for their high schoolers or want to use it in, in the classroom or if they're homeschooling. Um, I'm a, I'm a, Gordon Wood, anything by Gordon Wood is great. <laughs> and of course, you know that the uh, the defenders of the 1619 Project hate Gordon Wood, but he is he is a, a classic scholar. I don't know how he votes, but his books are very even-handed. He just had one come out this year. Yeah, his books for someone who's at a, maybe a little bit of a higher reading level. Biographies, I love reading biographies. And, and if you look in my end notes, you'll see references to a lot of a lot of books. So if you want to learn more about the practice of slavery in Africa, I cite John Thornton. He's a very good scholar on that. So people who want more in-depth information about a particular subject can go and look in my end notes and uh, you know so I do make a lot of references there. Got it. And books are called. Debunking Cowards In and Debunking the 1619 Project. Mary Grabar, thank you so much for being with me. Can it, Anywhere else people can find you? Yeah, I have a website, uh, marygrabar.com, G-R-A-B-A-R, and I have a nonprofit called Dissident Prof. It's short for Dissident Professor, dissidentprof.com. I have a newsletter, and so when I get articles published or if I have an announcement for a speaking engagement, I have a newsletter and I send out that information. So I encourage people to do that and sign up. And uh, if you go to my website, you can actually get $10 off of debunking the 1619 project. Uh, there's a special link there and it will take you uh, to that specific site and there's a code word and you'll get your $10 off by ordering from right cool. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. So really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for being with me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. If you enjoyed our show, please click subscribe to stay up to date with our YouTube channel and podcast and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so that we can keep delivering guys some great content. Thanks for listening and we will be back next week. We're going to talk about the issues that really matter. Our country, our economy, the Fed, QE, GDP, BTC, NFTs, AOC, the CCP, Cardi B, Ow. Yeezy, Yellow Socks, Iran, Joe Biden's dementia, Come on, man. and probably sex robots. We stand for a free and open debate and exchange of ideas. And if you disagree with anything we talk about, you are a racist and no better than Hitler. What? Let's get started.